Chapter 1. A Big Day for Ricky Ricky wakes up and looks out of his bedroom window. It's a nice, sunny morning. The sky is blue. He sits up in bed and remembers that this is an important day for him. Today is the day, he says to himself. Today I'm going to try out for the basketball team. Ricky's school, Howard High, has the best basketball team in the state. They win every game that they play. They also have the best coach, Mr. Bergman. Training with Coach Bergman is difficult and tiring. He makes the team practice every day after school and twice on the weekends. He's a tough coach, but that's why the Howard Hawks are the best. All the boys want to be on the team, and today Coach Bergman is going to choose the players for next season. Ricky's a good player, but he's only a junior, and there are a lot of senior boys who want to play too. Ricky's mom interrupts his daydreaming. Ricky, time to get up, she calls from the kitchen. Yeah, mom, Ricky answers. He jumps quickly out of bed. He has a shower and goes downstairs. His father is at the stove cooking breakfast and his mother is making coffee. Good morning, Ricky. Do you want two eggs and toast this morning? His father asks. It's a big day for you, son. You have your team tryouts. You need a good breakfast inside you. Yes, thanks. Two eggs, please, Dad, replies Ricky, grinning. I'm nervous, too, he adds. He takes some milk from the fridge and sits down at the table. Don't be nervous, Ricky. You're a good player. I know you're going to get on the team, his mom says, smiling. You practice enough. Thanks, Mom, says Ricky. But I'm only 16 years old. Don't forget, I'm only a junior. There are lots of seniors who want to play. They are big and strong. Mr. Anderson puts Ricky's eggs and toast on the table. There you go, Ricky. Have some orange juice, too. You need all your energy today. Ricky eats his eggs and drinks the orange juice. The doorbell rings and Ricky's best friend, Tony Caruso, comes in. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Anderson. Still eating, Ricky? Tony asks and sits down next to his friend. Hello, Tony. You have a big day today, too, says Mrs. Anderson. You're trying out for the team, too, aren't you? Would you like some orange juice or coffee? Yes, thanks. Some juice, please, replies Tony. Yeah, we all need our strength today. Coach Bergman's going to be really tough on us this afternoon, laughs Tony. You and Ricky are both talented players, and you're fitter than some of the seniors. You're going to do well, says Mrs. Anderson. Thanks, says Tony. He looks at Ricky's father. What are you reading, Mr. Anderson? Isn't that a photo of Howard High School on the front page of the newspaper? What does the article say? Crime in our high schools is increasing, quotes Ricky's dad. It says, someone broke three windows in the high school last night. They think vandalism and crime is increasing in schools in our area. At that moment, the phone rings. Mrs. Anderson answers it. Yes, he is. Just a minute, please. Ricky, it's for you. It's Stacy. Stacy is Ricky's new girlfriend. She's in his class at Howard High. She's the prettiest girl in their year, and she's intelligent. Ricky likes her a lot. Hi, Stacy. Ricky laughs. What? Oh, thanks. We need some luck. Yeah, see you at school. Bye. Stacy's a great girl, Ricky. You're really lucky, says Tony. Ricky is a bit embarrassed. He doesn't like to talk about his girlfriend in front of his parents. Uh, yeah, I know, Tony. Your girl, Trish, uh, is nice too, he says. Listen, we want to go to a movie this weekend. Do you and Trish want to come with us? He asks. Sounds fun. 
But we have to think about basketball today, not movies, says Tony. He picks up his glass of orange juice. Here's to us. Today we're going to play like Michael Jordan. The boys touch their glasses and drink. Ricky looks at the clock. Oh, it's late. We have to go, he says. He picks up his plate, puts it into the dishwasher, and gets his bag. Thanks, Mum, Dad. See you later, he calls. Bye, honey. Good luck, calls his mum. Good luck, son, shouts his dad. Chapter Two: Mysterious Messages. Ricky and Tony get off the school bus and walk towards Howard High. They're both very tense and excited. They talk about the tryouts all the way. It's going to be hard to study today, says Ricky. I'm too excited, and we have an English test this morning too. Yeah, I know. It's going to be difficult, says Tony. They walk to their lockers to get their books. Hey, Tony, look," says Ricky. "There's a note on my locker door. What does it say?" Tony asks him. Ricky opens the note and reads it aloud. "Don't go to basketball practice today. Something bad is going to happen." Ricky looks at his friend, puzzled. "What does it mean, Tony?" "I don't know," says Tony. "It's probably just a joke." Maybe someone wants to frighten you. Maybe someone wants to make the team and doesn't want you to come to the tryouts. Forget it, Ricky. He opens his locker. A note falls out onto the floor. Hey, Ricky, I have a note too. He says, surprised. He reads his note to Ricky. Basketball is for men, not boys. Don't try out for the team, or something bad is going to happen. Who's sending these notes? Who wants to threaten us? Asks Ricky. I don't know, but I don't like it. Replies Tony. Hi, Ricky. Says a friendly voice. Then, and Stacy Johnson walks over to their lockers. She is tall, with long blonde hair and blue eyes. She is smiling at Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Tony. How are you? She says. She gives Ricky a hug. Oh, hi, Stacy! Replies Tony. Great. How are you? What's the matter? She asks. Then, seeing his worried expression, is something wrong? Oh, it's probably nothing. Says Ricky. We found two notes in our lockers. Says Tony. We think it's a joke, but can I read them? Asks Stacy. She looks at the notes. Hmm. I don't think this is a joke. Let's tell the principal. Hey, wait a minute," replies Ricky. "We don't need to do that. I think Tony is right. The notes are jokes. I'm not scared. Let's forget them." Ricky, these notes aren't jokes," says Stacy. "Someone wants to frighten you. But why?" Okay, don't tell the principal, but please tell Coach Bergman. Suddenly, the bell rings for their first class. Time to go," says Ricky. "Look, Stacy, don't worry. These notes are nothing. See you at lunch." Oh, okay. See you then. And Stacy walks down the hall with a worried expression. Tony and Ricky go to their computer class. They switch on their PCs before class starts. I want to look at last night's basketball scores," says Tony. He goes into the internet. Yeah, the Los Angeles Lakers did it. They won. They beat the Chicago Bulls. He shouts. I want to check my email," says Ricky, laughing. Ricky types in the password for his email. You have mail," the computer voice says. Ricky opens up the first message. It's from Stacy, from Stacy J at h h s dot k dash one two dot i l to Ricky A at h h s 
dot k dash one two dot i l. Subject: Good luck. Message: Hi, Ricky. Just a note to say good luck today at practice. See you at school. Love, Stacy. He opens up the second message from Caper at whosemail dot com to Ricky A at hhs dot k dash one two dot i l. Subject: Warning. Message: Don't go to practice today, or something bad is going to happen. Tony, look. Ricky whispers as their teacher comes in. It's another mystery message. Wow, this is weird. Replies Tony. Who is Caper? I don't know. The message doesn't come from our school. Look at the email address. Quick, check yours and see if you have any messages from Caper. Tony types in his password. You have mail. Says the computer voice. Ricky and Tony look at each other. Tony clicks on the new message. Oh my God! It's from Caper too. He says, opening it. From Caper at whosemail dot com to Tony C at hhs dot k dash one two dot i l. Subject: Warning. Message: Don't try out for the basketball team today. This is your final warning. What? What are we going to do? Asks Ricky. I don't know, says Tony. But I know one thing: these stupid messages aren't going to stop us. We're going to go to basketball practice tonight, and we're going to try out for the team, and nobody is going to stop us. Chapter three: The basketball tryouts. It's lunchtime. Thank God, I'm so hungry, says Ricky to Tony. As they leave their English class and walk to their lockers, me too. English is so hard. I'm always hungry after our English lessons. Replies Tony. It isn't hard. It's easy. Says Ricky, laughing. But you have to do the homework, Tony. Yeah. Okay. I know. Replies his friend. They put their books away, lock their lockers, and walk to the lunchroom. Hey. There's Stacy and Trish. Let's eat with them," says Tony. They walk over to the table where the two girls are sitting. "Hi, what's the matter, girls?" asks Ricky, seeing their worried faces. "Ricky, we're scared," replies Stacy. "About what?" asks Ricky. "About those notes you and Tony found in your lockers," says Trish. "Please show them to the principal," says Stacy. "They could mean trouble." Oh, girls! It's nothing," says Tony. "It's just a bad joke." Just then, two tall senior boys stop at their table. "Hey, Anderson! Hey, Caruso! Are you trying out for the team today?" Kyle Martin asks them. "Yeah, and I'm going to make the team too," replies Ricky, laughing. "Oh, yeah? Well, watch out, kid! You don't want anything bad to happen today, eh?" Says the other senior, Pat Jones, with a nasty smile. Pat and Kyle walk away, laughing, to go sit at another table. I don't like Kyle Martin and Pat Jones. They're bullies. They always make trouble. Says Trish uncomfortably. Do you think they wrote the mysterious notes? Asks Stacy. Remember what Pat said. You don't want anything bad to happen today. The same words as your note, Ricky. No, I don't think they wrote the notes. Replies Ricky. They're creeps, but they just want to play basketball. Writing notes and sending emails is not their style. Sending email threats? What do you mean? Says Stacy, looking at him. Oh, nothing, honey. Forget it. Replies Ricky quickly as he sees Tony's expression. Let's talk about something else," says Tony. "What movie do you want to see this weekend, girls?" After school, Ricky and Tony go to the changing rooms to get ready for the basketball tryout. While they are putting on their sports clothes, Pat Jones comes in. He pushes Ricky roughly. Ricky falls against the lockers. 
Hey, watch out, Pat, shouts Ricky angrily. Why, what are you going to do, kid? Pat laughs and walks out of the changing room. Forget it, Ricky, says Tony calmly. He wants you to get angry. He wants you to play badly so you can't get on the team. Yeah, you're right, Tony. He's a moron, says Ricky after a moment. Come on, let's go out there and show them who's the best. Ricky and Tony walk out onto the basketball court, grinning. OK, everyone, onto the court, shouts Coach Bergman. Twenty-five boys get up and run onto the basketball court. Twenty-five boys want to be on the team, but only twelve boys are needed. Everyone is nervous. The players practice for an hour. Finally, Coach Bergman shouts, OK, we're going to play a game now. I want to watch you play so I can choose the boys to be on the school team. Play hard and play well, boys. Good luck. Tony and Ricky and three other boys are in Team A in the white shirts. Pat Jones and Kyle Martin are in Team B with some of their friends. They're wearing the red shirts. Coach Bergman blows his whistle and shouts, Let's play! He blows the whistle again and the game begins. Tony takes the ball and throws it to Ricky. Ricky triples down the court, dodging his opponents to the basket. He plays the ball well. He sees Pat Jones coming towards him and tries a shot at the basket. It's a good shot, but he's too far from the basket. He misses. Tony catches the ball on the rebound and shoots. Swish! The ball goes straight into the basket. Two points for Team A. Kyle Martin catches it and runs off down the court. He crashes into Tony, who falls to the floor. Hey, Martin, watch out! shouts Coach Bowman. Sorry, Coach! shouts Kyle, but Ricky sees him look at his friend Pat and grin. The teams play for 15 minutes. In the end, Team A wins by 16 points to 12. What do you think? asks Ricky, as he wipes his face with his towel. I don't know. It's going to be a really difficult decision for Coach Bergman. I sure hope we make the team, Ricky, replies Tony. Me too, says Ricky. Anyway, Tony, one thing's sure. Those mysterious messages were just a joke. Nothing bad happened at the tryout. No, it didn't. Not yet, says Tony. Chapter 4 A Hit and Run The next day, Ricky and Tony arrive at school early. There's a van from the local newspaper in front of the school. Two journalists are talking to a group of students outside the school gates. Why are those news reporters here? asks Ricky, surprised. I don't know, replies Tony. Look, Trish, Stacy and Mr. Stockton are talking to them. Let's find out what's going on. Mr. Stockton, we're doing another news article about the increasing problem of crime in our high schools. Is there a lot of crime at Howard High? One news reporter is asking the principal. Mr. Stockton says, No, we don't have much crime here. Sure, we have some vandalism, we have some minor discipline problems. A few students have truancy problems, but there's nothing major. I think our students feel safe here. Stacy and Trish, do you feel safe at this school? The other reporter asks the girls. Yeah, usually I feel safe, replies Trish. But there are some bullies at the school. What exactly do you mean? What do they do? asks the reporter. Well, some students are using notes and emails. But Stacy interrupts her friend. No, we don't have a lot of crime at our school, sir. We feel very safe here. She frowns at Trish and whispers. Not yet. We don't have any proof, Trish. Trish nods her head. She smiles at the reporters. Yes, all in all, we feel safe at Howard High. It's a good school. Well, thank you, Trish. Stacy and Mr. Stockton for your time, says the reporter, closing his notebook. Don't mention it, replies the principal. You're welcome, say Stacy and Trish. Tony and Ricky run to catch up with Stacy and Trish. Hey, what did they want? asks Ricky. 
They are writing another story on crime in high schools, like the one in the newspaper yesterday. Remember the broken windows at school the other day? Says Trish. They are trying to find out what happened, who the vandals are, and why they did it. So why were they asking you? Asked Tony. I don't know. Maybe because we're so gorgeous. Jokes Trish. Ricky, you and I have two famous girlfriends. He replies, and everybody laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> hey, what happened at the tryouts yesterday? Stacy asked. Then, are you two on the team? We're going to find out at lunchtime, says Ricky. Let's meet at the gym then, says Trish. Okay, see you there, replies Ricky. The four friends meet at the gym later. Tony and Ricky see two boys standing near the coach's door. Their heads are down. They're not smiling. Oh no! Says Ricky. Eric Kaplan and John McMillan aren't on the team. Look at their faces. They're seniors too. I think they're very good players. Well, obviously, coach doesn't agree. Keep your fingers crossed. Says Tony. Let's hope we make the team. They walk to the notice board outside Coach Bergman's door and look at the team list anxiously. Yahoo! Congratulations, Ricky and Tony! cries Trish suddenly. You're on the team. Look, there are your names. Hey, that's great! shouts Stacy, hugging Ricky. You're the best. Eric Kaplan comes over to them. You were lucky this time, Caruso and Anderson, he says furiously. But remember. You're just kids. Coach made a big mistake, and he walks away. Why is he so angry with you? Asks Trish. I suppose it's because he's a senior, but he isn't on the team. Replies Tony, shrugging his shoulders. Okay, but why is he so nasty? He's really hostile. Says Trish, puzzled. Hey, forget Eric Kaplan. He's an idiot. Says Stacy. Let's celebrate, guys. Let's go have pizza for lunch. Ricky, Tony, Stacy, and Trish walk out of the school towards the pizzeria, laughing and talking. Ricky turns to say something to Stacy as he steps off the curb. Suddenly, a car with dark windows comes round the corner. It speeds towards Ricky, getting faster and faster. Nobody knows whose car it is. They can't see the driver. Ricky, watch out! Shouts Tony, and Stacy screams. But it's already too late. The car hits Ricky and knocks him down onto the road, then speeds off without stopping. He lies on the road. His face is white. His friends surround him. Ricky, Ricky, are you all right? Cries Stacy. Ricky, can you hear us? Shouts Tony. A small pool of blood is forming under Ricky's head. His eyes are closed. He doesn't reply. Chapter five. Emergency. Ricky, Ricky, can you hear me? Asks Mr. Stockton. The principal kneels next to Ricky and puts his hand on his head. Ricky is lying on the ground, but he isn't moving. His eyes are still closed. Stacy, call Ricky's parents and tell them about the accident. Tony and Trish, ask for an ambulance. Ricky needs to go to the hospital. Stacy uses her cell phone to call Mr. and Mrs. Anderson. Trish runs into the school to call the hospital, but she can't find a telephone. She stops one of the students and says, "Please help me. This is an emergency. We need an ambulance. Can I use your cell phone?" The girl looks shocked. She gives Trish the phone. "Hello, nine one one." We need an ambulance at Howard High School immediately. There's been a road accident. It's an emergency. Please hurry. Ricky, can you hear me? Asks Mr. Stockton again. He looks at Stacy. Stacy, you try. He knows your voice. He says. Many of the students are coming out from the school now. They stand together, pointing at Ricky and talking. What's the matter? Asks one girl. Ricky Anderson had an accident. A car hit him. Replies another girl. Is he dead? Says the first. Oh God, I don't know, but he isn't moving. Stacy is trying to talk to Ricky. She's crying, but she tries to make him hear her voice. Ricky, can you hear me, honey? 
Ricky, it's Stacy. Please say something. Mr. Stockton looks carefully at Ricky. He is breathing normally. I don't think he's hurt badly, but his head is bleeding. He could have a concussion. Mr. Stockton looks at the crowd of curious students. Did any of you kids see the accident? He asks. Yes, me, says Charlie Bell. A red car came out of the parking lot very fast. It went straight at Ricky and knocked him down. What about the driver? Asks Mr. Stockton. Who was it? I don't know. The car had dark windows, but I think there were two people in the car. Replies Charlie. Did you recognize them? Asks Mr. Stockton. No. Sorry, Mr. Stockton. Replies Charlie. Suddenly, Ricky moves a little bit. He groans. Oh, <laughs> my head hurts. <laughs> he says. Oh, Ricky, you're okay. Cries Stacy. She holds his hand. She's crying. <laughs> my leg. I can't feel my leg. Ricky says weakly. Help me, please. Tony kneels down next to his friend. Ricky, listen. Don't move. The ambulance is coming. Your parents are going to the hospital. He says. Ricky is very weak. He can't speak, but he nods his head. The ambulance drives up to the school, its siren flashing, and two paramedics get out. <coughs> Move, please, kids," says one of the men. "We want to talk to the boy. What's your name?" the paramedic asks Ricky, while his colleague examines him carefully. "Ricky Anderson," replies Ricky very quietly. He tries to move and groans with pain. "No, don't move, son. Where's the pain?" asks the paramedic. In my head, and in my leg," replies Ricky. "What happened?" asks the other man, looking at Mr. Stockton. "It was a hit and run," says Mr. Stockton. "A car knocked him down, then drove away. In that case, we must inform the police," replies the paramedic, pressing a number on his cell phone. They put Ricky on the stretcher and take him to the ambulance. Stacy gets into the ambulance too. Ricky, don't worry. You're going to be okay. I'm going to the hospital with you. She holds his hand. Are you a relative, Miss? Asks one of the men. No, but begins Stacy. I'm sorry, Miss, but you can't come in the ambulance. Says the paramedic. Stacy gets out again. She's very upset. Don't worry, Stacy. We're going to the hospital. Says Tony. Come on, we can go by bus. Trish, Tony, and Stacy are shocked by Ricky's accident. They sit in silence on the bus. All of them are thinking that maybe it wasn't really an accident. We have to find the driver of that red car," says Stacy. "I'm sure he has some connection with the notes and emails you guys got. Those notes were not a joke. Someone wants to hurt Ricky and Tony. You're next." Chapter six. In hospital, the ambulance arrives at the hospital. Mister and Missus Anderson are already there. They watch anxiously as the paramedics pull the stretcher out of the ambulance. Oh, Ricky, are you all right? Asks his mother. She runs to her son's side. Yes, I think I'm all right, Mum. Replies Ricky. Don't worry. What happened, son? Asks his father. You can tell your parents the story later," says one of the paramedics. "You must rest now. Then the doctor is coming to see you." They take Ricky to the accident and emergency department and put him to bed. When they move him from the stretcher, his leg hurts very much. His parents are worried when they see the pain on his face. What's the matter with Ricky's leg? The doctor is coming soon," the paramedic tells them. And leaves the family alone in the room. Ricky starts to tell his mother and father the story. We were all walking out of the school gates. One minute, Tony and I were talking about the basketball team, and the next minute, a car knocked me down. I don't remember anything after that. He says. Basketball team? Asks Mrs. Anderson. Oh yeah, Mum. I made the team. Our names are on Coach Bergman's list," 
says Ricky. He smiles, and then he groans in pain as his leg starts to hurt again. His mom takes his hand. Don't worry, honey, the doctor's coming now, she says. At that moment, Trish, Tony, and Stacy arrive. Ricky, how are you? asks Stacy. She comes over to the bed. She takes his other hand. I'm all right, Stacy. Thanks, Ricky says, smiling. The doctor is coming to examine him now, Stacy. Mrs. Anderson tells her. We know about the accident, says Mr. Anderson to Tony. Do you know who the driver of the car could be? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson. I don't. I didn't recognize the car, replies Tony. The car has dark windows, adds Trish. But Charlie Bell thinks there were two people inside. It must be someone who hates Ricky, said Stacy sadly. Hates Ricky? Who could hate him? asks Mrs. Anderson, surprised. Tony frowns at Stacy. He doesn't want her to tell Ricky's parents about the mysterious messages. A nurse comes in then and introduces himself. Hello, I'm Drew Carlson. I'm your nurse. Ricky, please put this thermometer under your arm. I'm going to give you an injection to stop the pain. Then the doctor wants to do some tests on your leg. He turns to the others. I'm sorry, but you must all wait outside for a few minutes. The doctor enters the room. Hello, Ricky. I'm Doctor Brown. How are you feeling? She asks kindly. Not too bad, Doctor, but my leg hurts a lot. Replies Ricky. Ah,、huh. let's have a look. She says. She feels Ricky's left leg. Ricky cries in pain. Oh, I want some X-rays of that leg. Says the doctor to Nurse Carlson. Please take Ricky to the X-ray room. I think your left leg might be fractured, Ricky, but don't worry; it's not too serious. We can fix it. Can I still play basketball, Doctor? I made the school team today, and I want to play in the championship this year. Says Ricky. Congratulations, replies Doctor Brown. But I don't think you can play basketball for some time. We must put a plaster cast on your leg, and you need to rest it for a few weeks. But we start basketball practice on Monday," says Ricky desperately. "Sorry, Ricky," says Doctor Brown. "Now I want to talk to your parents." And she leaves him alone. Ricky's friends come back in. Ricky, we were talking about the notes you and Tony received at school. The notes were right. Something bad did happen," says Stacy. "But who is behind all these threats?" asks Trish. I don't know," says Tony. "What about Caper? That's the name on the emails." I think we have to find the driver of the car," says Trish. "Who has a red car in our school?" "That's going to be impossible, Trish. I think it was a Subaru, but there are a lot of red Subarus in town, and the car could be stolen." "Wait a minute. I remember something," says Stacy slowly. The car has an unusual wheel. The back wheel on the right was different from the others. That's a good clue," says Tony. "I'm sure Caper and the red car are connected. When we find Caper, we find the mystery driver." "Don't worry, Ricky. We're going to find out who is doing all this," says Trish to her friend. And Stacy and Tony nod in agreement. "You bet." Chapter Seven. More from Caper. The next day, Ricky comes home from the hospital. His friends telephone him from school. Stacy puts her phone on speaker so that they can all talk to Ricky and hear him. Hi, Ricky. It's us. How are you? Asks Stacy. I'm fine, says Ricky. But my leg's in a cast, so I have to stay in bed. I want to be at school with all of you. It's boring here at home alone. You need to rest so that your leg can get better," says Tony. "I'm going to talk to Coach Bergman today. I think he's going to let you stay on the team. He's a good guy." "Thanks, Tony," replies Ricky. "Oh, and a news reporter is coming over to my house today. She wants to interview me about the accident. I'm going to be on TV."
Mr. Stockton wants to see us today, too. We're going to tell him about Caper, says Stacy. I don't think that's a good idea. He's going to think we're just stupid kids, says Ricky. We have to find out some more about Caper first. We need more proof. Then we can tell the principal. Okay, agrees Tony after a pause. But I don't like it. These people could be dangerous. Look what happened to you, Ricky. Ricky hears the school bell ringing. We have to go to class now, says Trish. See you after school. Bye. Later that day, the doorbell rings at Ricky's house. Mrs. Anderson brings a news reporter, a sound technician, and a cameraman into the living room. Ricky is lying on the sofa. The cameraman sets up his camera and begins to film the interview. The sound technician holds the microphone over their heads and begins to record their conversation. The news reporter introduces herself to Ricky. She asks him a lot of questions about crime in his school, the accident, and his injuries. She thinks Ricky's accident could be connected to the vandalism at school. Ricky isn't sure. He tells her about the basketball team and how he can't play in the championship until his leg gets better. But he doesn't tell her about Caper and the messages. He doesn't tell her that he suspects some of the basketball players. He knows they can't prove there is a connection between them and the accident. Not yet. During lunchtime at school, Tony, Trish, and Stacy go to the computer room. Tony opens his email. There is another strange message. It says, "From underscore hyperlink underscore caper at whose mail dot com underscore to underscore hyperlink underscore Tony C at h h s dot k dash one two dot." I L underscore subject warning message Anderson's accident wasn't an accident. You are next, Caruso. Tony, I don't like this," says Trish. "Let's tell Mr. Stockton now." Not yet, Trish. I want to send our friend Caper an answer this time," says Tony. He hits the reply button and writes his message from. Underscore hyperlink underscore Tony C at h h s dot k dash one two dot i l underscore two underscore hyperlink underscore caper at whose mail dot com underscore subject challenge message I'm not afraid we're going to find you start running sucker. Tony, do you think that's a good idea? Asked Stacy. If Caper gets angry, who knows what he's going to do? I want to provoke him. Replies Tony. I want to know who Caper is. I think if he gets mad, he's going to make a mistake. Then we can identify him. Let's go to Ricky's house and talk to him about it after school. Suggests Stacy. We can make a plan. Good idea. Agrees Trish. Four heads are better than three. After school, the friends go over to Ricky's house. How's your leg, Ricky? Asks Tony. It really hurts. I don't know when I'm going to be able to walk, much less play basketball. Answers Ricky gloomily. How was school? Tony got another email from Caper. Trish tells him. We worried. Tony tells Ricky about the message and his reply. We have to find out who Caper is," says Ricky. "That's the key to the mystery." I think he's a basketball player," says Stacy. "He wants to hurt you and Tony because you made the team. If you two can't play, Coach Bergman is going to need two more players. Maybe Caper hopes to get on the team that way. Maybe it's Kyle," says Trish. "Remember he knocked you down at practice, Tony." Yeah, but maybe it's Pat. He said something bad was going to happen in the lunchroom. Answers Ricky. Or maybe it's Eric or John. They're seniors and they're not on the team. Adds Tony. How can we find out who Caper is? There are too many suspects. Says Stacy. Listen, replies Ricky. 
I have an idea. Chapter 8 Ricky's Plan His friends listen carefully as Ricky explains his plan. I want to have a party. I want to invite all the players from the tryouts. Maybe one of the players knows something about the messages and the accident, he says. Do you think Caper is going to come? asks Stacy. If he's one of the players, he's going to be invited, replies Ricky. I think it's a dangerous idea, says Trish. This Caper is a dangerous person. He could do something to hurt you or Tony at the party. But we want to find out who Caper is, answers Tony. He wants to stop us from playing basketball, but I am not going to let him. The friends plan the party. They're going to have a lot of food and drinks. They're also going to have music and dancing. The party is going to be in Ricky's backyard. Tony says he can bring his new CD player, and Trish and Stacy are going to buy the food. Ricky makes a list of 25 people to send invitations to. The friends write the text of the invitation together. It says, You are invited to Ricky's Get Well Soon and Birthday Party on Friday, February the 4th at 9pm where Ricky Anderson's house, 495 Columbus Drive. Saturday night comes at last. Everything is prepared for the party. There are hot dogs, burgers, salads and chips. Tony brings the Cokes and sodas. Ricky walks with his crutches out into the backyard. Tony is putting up lights and setting up the CD player. Sorry that I can't help much, says Ricky. Hey, don't worry. You have to rest so you can get better quickly. Then you can play basketball again. The doorbell rings. Oh, here's our first guest, says Ricky. I want to answer the door. Remember our plan, everybody? The others nod. They are going to try to find out about Caper by talking to the players during the party. They need to know who is jealous of Ricky and Tony and who drives a red Subaru. They also need to find out who uses email a lot. Could the name Caper be a code word for something? The friends all feel excited and tense. What's going to happen tonight? Two of the basketball players from the team are at the door. Hi, Ricky, says Anthony. Good to see you. How are you? We miss you at practice. I miss it too, but Tony always tells me about it, replies Ricky. You guys work hard. The party's out back in the yard. Have fun. Later, Stacy is talking to Ricky when the bell rings again. Oh, hi, Pat. Hi, Kyle. Nice to see you. Come in. The party's in the yard. Thanks, Anderson. We're here with Eric Kaplan and John Roberts. I don't see them, says Stacy, looking out into the street. Where are they? Oh, they're parking the car, replies Pat, looking away. In the next street? asks Stacy, incredulously. Oh, um, Eric's car makes a lot of noise, so he's parking it in the next street, replies Kyle quickly. He doesn't want to annoy your neighbors. That doesn't sound like Eric Kaplan at all, thinks Stacy. He's not usually so considerate. Eric and John arrive soon after and join the rest of the party. The music is playing loudly, and a lot of people are dancing. Trish notices Eric and Pat talking together in the dark corner of the garden. She looks around to see if anyone is watching her, then goes around the trees behind them so that they can't see her. She goes nearer and listens to them. They don't suspect anything, Eric is saying. They're too stupid. Well, it was a risk to bring the car tonight. That wasn't clever, Eric, replies Pat. I parked it in the next street so they can't see it, and the mechanic is going to change the wheel on Monday. No one will recognize my car then, says Eric. I hope not. We could get into trouble. Pat is nervous. Hey, don't worry, Pat. Anderson isn't going to play basketball again, and we're going to stop Caruso, too, replies Eric. Hmm. Let's go back to the party before someone notices us, Pat says. 
Trish quietly comes out of the shadows and goes over to Tony. Tony, quick! Get Stacy and Ricky and meet me in Ricky's room in five minutes. I have something important to tell all of you. The four friends are sitting on Ricky's bed looking expectantly at Trish. What is it, Trish? asks Stacy. I think I know who the driver of the red car is, replies the friend. Who? asks Ricky. Eric Kaplan. Now he wants to stop Tony too. Tony's face is white. How do you know that, Trish? He asks. I heard them talking in the garden. They didn't see me, she explains. What are we going to do now? asks Stacy, afraid. I don't know yet, replies Ricky. Let's go back to the party before they notice we're not there. Perhaps we can catch them out if they think we don't know anything. Chapter Nine: The Caper Mystery Is Solved. It's one a.m. and the party is finished. The last guests leave and the four friends start clearing up. The party was a success, Tony is saying, and so was our plan. Now we know the driver of the car, but the seniors don't think we know anything. Trish, you're a good detective. I'm going to call you Miss Marple. <laughs> They all laugh. Yes, you're like Agatha Christie's detective, Miss Marple. Jokes, Ricky. Trish smiles. Sorry, everyone. Says Stacy with a serious face. But in fact, we don't know Eric is the driver. All we know for sure is that the red car is his. Maybe another person drives it sometimes. We need more information. And we need more proof to connect Eric with Caper. Adds Tony. They sit in silence, thinking. There must be a clue in the emails that can lead us to the culprits. Says Stacy. Caper, C A P E R. Hmm. Eric Kaplan. But where's the connection? She writes the name Eric Kaplan on a piece of paper and studies it. Eric Kaplan, Kaplan Eric, E C C E E Kaplan Eric C Er Cap Cap Er. Look! She shouts suddenly. Caper. Stacy shows them the paper. Look at Eric's name, Eric Kaplan. Do you see the connection? I don't see anything," says Tony, puzzled. "Stacy, you're right," shouts Ricky. "Look, Tony, Trish, she's right. Caper is Eric's username on the computer. He uses the initial parts of his name for his username. In this case, the first three letters of his last name and the first two letters of his first name, C A P E R. Congratulations, Stacy." You're too clever to go out with an idiot like me. Good work, Stacy," says Trish. "Now let's catch Caper." "Oh, Trish," asks Tony. "We're going to send him an email," she replies. "But he mustn't know it's from us," says Ricky. "Yes, you're right. But we can send the message from my dad's computer and use a false username," replies Trish. "He's going to think the message is from Pat." "How?" Asks Stacy. We don't have Pat's password. We can trick Eric. We can write to him with a new username and tell him that it's Pat's new username. We can say that he has a new username now because the old one isn't safe. What are we going to write in the message? Asks Tony. It's too late to write the message now. Replies Trish. We have to think about it carefully. Let's meet tomorrow afternoon at my house to prepare the message. Tony, can you give Stacy and me a ride home? Sure. I have my mum's car tonight. It's parked outside. Come on, girls, let's go. Ricky, see you tomorrow. Okay, guys. Bye. See you. Replies Ricky sleepily. On the way home in Tony's car, Tony and the girls are talking about the party. Tony comes to a red light and puts his foot on the brake, but something is wrong. The car doesn't stop. Tony pushes and pushes on the brake pedal, and nothing happens. Tony, Tony, what are you doing? Stop the car! Shouts Stacy. I can't! Cries Tony. The brakes aren't working. Another car is coming towards them very fast. 
Tony turns the wheel hard to avoid the other car. The girls see the black post of the traffic lights in front of them. Stacy screams as the car smashes the into the traffic lights. They all fall from their seats. A few minutes pass. They sit immobilized with shock. Trish recovers first and turns to look at her two friends. Tony is slumped over the steering wheel. He isn't moving. His eyes are shut. He looks very pale. Tony! cries Trish. Oh my God, Tony, Tony! Chapter 10 A Close Call Tony, Tony, are you all right? repeats Trish, shaking him. At first, Tony doesn't react. Then, slowly, he lifts his head. Trish, what? What happened? We hit the traffic lights, says Stacy. Are you okay? The brakes, says Tony. The brakes don't work. It's strange. Oh, look at my mum's car. It's a wreck. Don't worry about that now, Tony. Let's leave the car here and call a taxi. We all need to go home and rest. Keeper said I was next, says Tony slowly. This situation is getting really dangerous. I'm scared. Don't think about it now, says Stacy. Let's just go home. The next day, Tony, Ricky and Stacy arrive at Trish's house after lunch. Trish is sitting at the computer. She types a new username and starts writing the message to Eric Kaplan. To underscore hyperlink underscore caper at whose mail dot com underscore from underscore hyperlink underscore cool guy at whose mail dot com underscore subject change of username Eric is P I have a new username the old one wasn't safe anymore we must be very careful no one must be able to connect us to the accidents C and A aren't going to do anything. They're too scared. They're ready to quit the team, I think. But we need to cover our tracks. Let's talk tomorrow after school. Cool guy. There, says Trish. Now let's see if Eric or Caper replies and gives us some written proof. She sends the email. The friends go to make some coffee. When they come back, there is a reply to their message. It says, To underscore hyperlink underscore cool guy at whose mail dot com underscore from underscore hyperlink underscore caper at whose mail dot com underscore subject change of username cool guy Anderson and Caruso don't know anything no one can connect the accidents to us quit worrying no one can touch us. See you tomorrow. Caper. That's it! shouts Trish. We've got them! She prints the message and puts it in her school bag. Tomorrow afternoon, we can go and see Mr. Stockton and tell him everything we know. But we still don't know exactly what Eric and Pat did, or who helped them, says Ricky. You're right, but Mr. Stockton can investigate that, says Stacy. We don't want any more trouble. The next morning, Tony and Ricky are in the computer room at school working on a maths problem. Suddenly, Pat, Kyle and Eric come into the room. They close the door and Kyle puts a chair in front of it so no one can come in. Tony is nervous. What do you want, Pat? He asks. Don't move, Caruso, says Eric sharply. Sit down, now. You think you're really smart, you two, don't you? Well, we're on to you, says Pat. I don't know what you're talking about, replies Ricky defiantly. Now, Anderson, that's not very honest for a good little boy scout like you, sneers Eric. Yeah, a boy that's always top of the class and sucks up to Coach Bergman to get onto the team, adds Pat. Eric shows them a print out of their email with the false username. Kyle was at my house yesterday when I got this. He went to play billiards with Pat. He asked Pat about his new username, but Pat didn't know anything. Tony and Ricky say nothing. They feel scared. 
I suppose now you want to go blab to old Stockton, eh, Anderson? Well, we're going to teach you a lesson. You have to understand we mean business. Ricky stands up, but Eric steps forward and pushes him to the ground. Very angry. Ricky tries to get up, but Eric pushes him again. He pulls Ricky's hair and lifts his arm to punch him. Get off the basketball team, Anderson. I'm going to fix you. Tony tries to catch Eric's arm, but Kyle and Pat hold him back. Eric, don't! He shouts, That's not the way! Don't make any more trouble! Shut up, Caruso. You're next, shouts Eric. <laughs> Chapter 11 Return to the team. Suddenly they hear voices in the corridor outside. Ricky sees Stacy's face at the glass panel in the door. Someone tries to open the door from the other side. Kyle shouts to Pat to help him keep it shut. Eric is too angry to notice. He hits Ricky on the head. Ricky is on the floor. He can't get up because of his leg. Then he sees his crutches next to the computer table. If he can reach one of them, he grabs Eric's leg and pulls him down. Eric falls, and at that moment, Ricky grabs the crutch and pins him down with it. The door opens with a crash, and Mr. Stockton and some of the senior boys burst into the room. That's enough, boys, he shouts. Captain, Martin, Jones, go to my office immediately. You're in serious trouble. The police are coming for you. Eric is furious. As the seniors lead him and the others away, he shouts at Ricky and Tony. I'm going to finish you. I'm going to break your other leg, Anderson, and yours too, Caruso. Later the four friends are in the lunchroom at school when Mr. Stockton walks over to the table. He smiles at the four students. Kyle, Pat and Eric are not going to be in school for a while. The police are investigating their part in Ricky's accident and the problems with Tony's mom's car. Kyle and Pat aren't going to play basketball this year. Coach says he doesn't want troublemakers on the team. He turns to Ricky. I see you don't have your crutches anymore, Ricky, he adds. When are you going to start basketball practice again? Well, the doctor says my leg is much better. I can start playing again next month, replies Ricky. That's good. But take it easy. You don't want to hurt your leg again, says Mr. Stockton. Now, there's a newspaper reporter in my office who wants to talk to you. He wants to do a story in the local newspaper about Eric and your accidents. Come to my office in thirty minutes. Stacy, Trish, you two girls, too. Later in the afternoon, Ricky and Tony are in the locker room. Tony is getting ready for practice when Anthony comes in and talks to them. Kyle Martin and Pat Jones are off the team. Coach says, I'm on the team. I'm going to play in the game on Friday night. That's great, Anthony. You're a good player. You deserve it, says Ricky, smiling. I hope your leg gets better and you can start playing again soon, Ricky, replies Anthony. We're going to be a fantastic team this year. They walk out onto the basketball court. Ricky sits down to watch the practice session. He thinks, Now, oh, all the trouble's finished. I just want to play basketball. Chapter 12. Ricky's Long Shot Four weeks later, the basketball championship starts. The boys from Howard High are in the gym practicing for their first game on Saturday. Ricky is back. It's his first practice since the accident. He wants Coach Bergman to choose him to play on Saturday. He tries to run fast, but his leg hurts a bit. Take it easy, Anderson, shouts Coach Bergman. Don't force your leg. We need you for the game on Saturday night. Ricky is pleased. He is going to play in the game. He works hard during practice. He shoots well. He plays intelligently in the practice game. He plays well with the other players. After practice, he and Tony walk to the showers. You played great tonight, Ricky, says Tony. If you play like that on Saturday, Redwood High doesn't have a chance. Coach Bergman comes into the locker room to talk to Ricky. Anderson, he says. I think you're ready to play in a real match. I want you there on Saturday. You and Caruso are a great duo. Thanks, coach. That's fantastic, replies Ricky. Oh, and Ricky, 
I am sorry for what happened to you and Tony. Captain and the others were really out of control, but they're going to be punished. I hope now they understand their behavior was very wrong. You can't become a good basketball player by threatening other players or hurting them. You and Tony are not only better players, but you're better sportsmen than they are. Thanks, coach, says Tony. We're going to work hard. We appreciate that you chose us to be on the team, even if we're juniors, says Tony sincerely. Okay, boys, show me I was right. Win the match against Redwood High on Saturday, laughs Coach Bourbon. It's Saturday night, and the arena is full. There are a lot of people watching the game. The band is playing loud music, and the cheerleaders are dancing with their pom-poms. The two teams run onto the court. They practice shooting and throwing the ball. Then the buzzer sounds, and the game begins. Coach Berkman calls his players into a group. Well, guys, this is our first game of the year. Redwood has a good team. It's going to be a tough match. Do your best. All the players nod. They join hands in a circle and shout, Go! 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 go fly, fly high, high Howard Hawks! The crowd jumps to its feet. Everyone's clapping and shouting. Some people wave flags with pictures of hawks on them. The team feels the energy of the crowd. They are excited and tense. They want to win. At halftime, the score is 46-40 for Redwood. Both teams are playing very well. At the end of the second half, the score is even at 63-63. There are only 15 seconds left. The crowd is wild with excitement. Coach Bergman calls a timer. Okay, guys. We only have one more shot. Anderson, do you want to take the shot? You bet, Coach. Vicky replies. Okay, then. Do all of you remember the setup? Yes, Coach. The players say. The buzz of sounds. They go back onto the court. Tony passes the ball to Anthony, who throws it to Don. Don dodges two Redwood players and passes it to Ricky. Ricky jumps, takes aim quickly, and throws the ball at the basket. Is the shot too short? He's still a long way from the basket. He doesn't go in. Ricky's heart sinks, but the referee is blowing his whistle. Ricky has two free shots. He goes to the free throw line. He takes aim and shoots. The ball hits the basket, but it doesn't go in. He misses the shot. I have to make this second shot, he thinks to himself. It's our last chance. This is the longest shot of his life. He takes a deep breath, fixes his eye on the basket, and shoots. The ball goes around the edge of the basket twice. He thinks, go in, please go in. Then the ball drops. It's in. Ricky scores. The crowd goes crazy. The Hawks win the game by one point. Players carry Ricky on their shoulders around the arena, and the crowd shouts and cheers. He sees his parents standing, waving to him. They are very proud. He sees Stacy jumping and cheering, and Trish next to her. He knows that this is the happiest moment of his life. After all the difficulties he had before this game, now he knows it was worth it. The day he played the long shot.